Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the third and final installment for the full semester of our In Conversation series. I just want to give a, a big and special shout out for, for everyone who's been coming along to these and really given an opportunity to learn about so much more than they do just purely in the studio or in their internship or just in a conversation somewhere. And the fact that we have these incredible industry movers, shakers, influencers, um, they, they will come and very generously share their time with us, share their experience, and really, um, you know, let's face it, pass on the baton to the next generation of creatives. So I'm um, very, very thankful and respectful for, of the ladies joining us, joining us this evening. Um, as to with Rachel Lifter, who, 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 who kind of scratches away at the surface of, of, of all our visitors, and um, we'll really dig in and help you find the kernels of inspiration and conversation. And also, let's just not forget that, you know, as the next generation of industry aspirants, this is an opportunity for you to connect. This is an opportunity for you to ask your questions, the relevancy of what you see for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your careers. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you very much, ladies. Welcome to Parsons. Welcome to the School of Fashion. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again. Thanks, Neil, for that intro. Set the pressure up for me, but that's okay. I can <laughs> handle it. Um, welcome, everybody, to the third installment of In Conversation. So this time, we're focused on brand identity, narrative building, and these three industry professionals are gonna help us through it. Um, what I'd like to do is first start by introducing you through your titles, and then maybe you could speak to what that role is and how you came to that position. Give us a little trajectory through your career. Um, Shu, would you like to start? Sure. You are Global Creative Director of Brand Experience at Uniqlo. What does that mean? Yes. Um, it means that I work across many different disciplines within the company. So um, I work with the designers to come up with the best stories uh, for how they bring their products to market, which is why I'm really excited to see you all here, because I think um, there could be a good dialogue. Um, and then I think about how you take that product into the market. So whether that's through a store experience, um, through imagery, through digital, um, PR, all of these sort of different marketing channels, um, I work you know, with the teams to kind of take that through so that by the time you're able to buy it, you kind of understand hopefully uh, what the story was behind it. So I'm working across all of these different um, departments and with different people. Um, and I have a small sort of creative team that's just down the street and we do a lot of the internal creative for Uniqlo, so the advertising campaigns um, and things like that. And I'm usually really jet lagged, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might be tonight, so sorry. So how did you come to this position? What is your, you know, professional trajectory look like? Yeah, I mean, I started, um, I, I studied art history um, and I thought I was gonna, you know, go on and get advanced degrees. I actually felt that, um, you know, retail seemed so far from what I was even thinking about. But at the time, um, this was like early 2000s, uh, there was this huge, you know, digital commerce boom that was happening. It was starting to like shake up the world. So I, I fell into that and sort of through design, I was designing and then I just kept working in uh, more on the, the advertising side. Um, eventually I, I started working at Nike um, and I launched a bunch of different projects there. Uh, like Sakai and Nike. <laughs> and some of these sort of these, uh, I don't know, limited edition projects, this was actually um, a space that we did in Brazil. So the idea at Nike was you, you would, it, it was actually really driven by the communication. So the communication would drive kind of what product you would make. So it's like, we need a really amazing product in Brazil. Like somebody please design this and we'll take it to market. So a little bit of a backwards, I think maybe from what you would imagine. Um, but uh, so I worked at Nike and then I switched to Uniqlo, got really excited about 
a Japanese brand, and especially one that was trading on um, democracy. Um, so you you know you can buy something at a very reasonable price. It's good quality. It goes with everything you already have. Um, that was really interesting to me to see um, how I could work uh, in that context. So cool. here I am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ashley, your title is Senior Art Director for Assembled Brands and Editorial Director at The Line. What does that mean? And uh, <laughs> how'd you get there? It means a lot of things. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, I think everyone at The Line, because it's a, a small startup, um, wears a lot of hats. And um, the editorial director role is more of like the storytelling and the brand identity um, that we do through different vendors. Um, <sighs> ranging from advertorials to editorial storytelling. Um, so I help with the art direction, the concepting, work with merchandisers and marketing people to develop um, just all the different um, storytelling that we do, all the chapters on the line. Um, and then with assembled brands, what we basically, um, because, uh, when I first started at the line, we were um, we had like really large editorial budgets, and as those slowly kind of dwindled, um, because we're such a small team and where we're creating like a lot of content, um, we started pitching doing edit, uh, advertorials for the different vendors that we carried. So we worked with like Vince, Kiki, Mark Parnas. Um, I'm trying to think. There's like so many, <laughs> but all the different vendors that we um, carry at the line and um, started shooting content for them. So that's kind of the work through like Kate and a protagonist and all the different brands that we carry at the line. We started shooting editorial for them as well. Interesting. Yeah. So how did you come into that position and that role? What does your professional trajectory look like? Uh, my trajectory, so I've come from like working with really big corporations. Um, I worked with uh, Nordstrom, with Olivia Kim um, on their thing called Space. I did art direction for their catalog. Um, I worked a lot with Nike, actually. That's how I met <laughs> Shu. Um, and then uh, I, I left and went to do creative direction for Totokayo, which is now here, and left Totokayo to come to the line. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, Alex, you are a photographer and creative director of Unconditional Magazine. Um, yes, so I'm a photographer and also the creative director of Unconditional Magazine, which is an independent based, uh, independent New York based women's magazine. Um, we started it three and a half years ago or something, completely um, kind of, you know, it was a bit of a spontaneous project, and not spontaneous, but it, I had been thinking about it for a long time, but I think we started, we were, were only a team of three people, and we create all of the content ourselves, so you can only imagine, well, three, four people, but it's, you know, we're a very, very small team, and then at the same time, I'm also a photographer that work commercially, and a lot of my clients are, you know, all over the world, but I basically link my commercial work and the work that I do for Unconditional as a creative director and sort of merge the two. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think like, um, basically a lot, of my, a lot of my work that I get hired for a lot of time, they ask me to basically do what I do for Unconditional or for those brands. So whether it's advertising, whether it's, uh, you know, smaller projects, bigger projects, it, it really depends what the project is, but we sort of try and find a way to incorporate what probably when there's a special project that comes or a very specific, you know, uh, collection or product or whatever, whatever it is, these women come up with the project and then they sort of like, someone will come to me and say, oh, you know, this is what we're thinking. And then I usually come at it from a pretty early stage. So it's not just like come and shoot. It's usually pretty early on. And it's, it's like, this is what we're thinking. This is, how would you do it? What's your, what's your process on that? And then up until the campaign comes out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's a bit complicated, but. <laughs> No, thank you. Well, actually, that leads us into the kind of next area of questions I want to talk about. So I want to lead us through a narrative that talks about how do you produce images and narratives for brands, but then how do you produce narratives across brands, um, and then going into think questions about collaboration as well as working in the industry. But what you just said about 
um, companies coming to you to reproduce what you make in unconditional editorial was in a way, for their yeah. commercial work. Yeah. That's a, opening up an interesting question, and I wanted to ask both of you about this. How do you step into brands, and all three of you, how do you step into existing brands' narratives and contribute as potentially freelance or hired for a specific job, but then also how do you keep your own kind of aesthetic through that? Um, so obviously each brand that, uh, you know, big brands have an identity. They have a, they have a DNA. They're, they're some, you know, Uniqlo, the line, the, there's identities that are being built. So unless the, the brand itself is trying to completely change, do a swap over, there's already a lot of sort of like vocabulary that's ingrained in the, in the brand. So you already know that you're not gonna shoot, let's say like, you know, maybe like, you know, of course you can mix things, but you're not necessarily gonna shoot like a Victoria's Secret model for Uniqlo, or you're not gonna shoot a, you know, a certain model for vice versa. Like each brand has their, their point of view. So then when there's a specific project, at least for me, and they hire me, it's sort of, they already have what they want. They're just saying, how do you put a little bit of yourself but still do what we do? So how can we, you sort of merge the two worlds? And I think as a photographer, what sort of takes a while is to build your signature so that people come to you for what you do. I think that's the, the hardest part. And I think the the trickiest part to, to build. And then once you sort of get that, then then it's it, I find that it is quite very collaborative because a brand will say, we're launching a, you know, a denim capsule or we're launching whatever the project is. And then it's sort of like, how do you merge the two between what you do, what they do, and come up with, some, with something that feels, you know, fresh and exciting and interesting and keeping things relevant, I guess. But I don't know, you might have a completely different. No, I think that the work, I mean, like I definitely deal with that at the line just because the line's such a specific, um, almost like I wanna say like conservative kind of taste level. And I think the work that I've gotten to do through Assembled Brands has been really incredible because we've gotten to work with so many different brands that have completely different brand identities. Um, I mean, just a few being like Rosetta Getty, even Kate is like a lot more feminine, protagonist is a lot more menswear. Um, and just like being able to interpret those um, just through the way that we shoot it. Um, and a lot of times um, for the line, just to um, like kind of consolidate and like do a lot, get a lot of work out of one day, we'll shoot like several different um, brands like a Vince story, a Kiki Mart Pranas story, uh, um, uh, like Reposy jewelry story and all of those things are done over the course of one day. But it's just a ma matter of like changing the hair and makeup, changing the lighting, changing the set and um, really kind of taking in what each brand is all about. And I think that's kind of the beauty of the line but it's also been really fun to get to reinterpret those um, in their own, yeah. Way. Could you speak to some specific examples? I know you sent in videos, images, either of you, um, that are just kind of what? Sorry, it's the <laughs> I think that's Alex's weird. Work. That's why it's been repeating things, <laughs> but we're getting there. So this is. Those are um, so those were some images that we did um, for a brand called Edie Parker, which was kind of an interesting one, um, only because it's a very um, like fun like the actual product is like kind of wild kitschy bags. And um, so we really got to interpret the styling um, quite like more, it was definitely more pushed. They were like uh, Pierre Cardin um, vintage pieces, which is something that we would have never got a chance to work with at the line. So it was a little bit more fun. <laughs> um, and they were shot by a photographer, Carolyn Jacobs, who's based in Paris. So how did you, could we go back to those? Yes. So, yeah, so t can you tell us about bringing in Cardin clothes? And how did you decide on this concept? And can you The stylist is actually in the audience. <laughs> um, no, she called them, them in from their showroom. But, um, and yeah, why this concept to tell the story for the brand, for the bags? What's that? Why this concept to tell the story of the bags? Um, I mean, honestly, this was like a budget thing where we didn't have too much to work with, so we shot at their showroom. <laughs> uh, 
um, on the top of their roof. It was like kind of the only um, way to make it work. Um, so we kind of, it was like a pretty makeshift kind of a day where. It doesn't look like that. <laughs> Didn't well, actually that. to like kind of talk about that, it's like a lot of, a lot of things you have, you really have to be really crafty and it's really like not about the money that you spend because I think that you can create really amazing things with very little budget and I think that the to me at least with unconditional in the beginning we I mean we had like no money like no money at all like we were creating our like you know an editorial like pretty much in my bedroom or my kitchen or whatever we could do. And that's why I say we created Unconditional very prematurely because we, we had no resources and no budget. But I think that mentality is, is really important because you have to understand to, to make something really beautiful or really interesting, it's not about the thousands of dollars that you spend. It's, it's really about the concept. It's about the team and it's about the effort and it's about the idea. But it's the money is, it's like, of course it helps if there's a big budget to get you to a crazy location or to get you a better model or, or those kinds of things, but you, you have to kind of put the money aside. And that's why I think even as like, you know, a college student and things, it's, you, you can never say, oh, I can't do this because I don't have the money or I don't have the, the budget or because the, it's really important to stay really crafty and really like think through things. Because for example, like like the, the campaign that you did, it's like, you know, you didn't necessarily have uh, like a big budget, but nobody would know that, and it looks amazing, and nobody would know that, you know, you were even working on a budget. Someone could say, oh, well, maybe they flew a whole team out to New York and, you know, got this crazy rooftop, and mm -hmm. and I think that's that's kind of the beauty of it, is that you're able to, because you've worked editorially, and as you would know also, it's that's what makes it really amazing, is coming up with very cool things on very low budget, and I think I don't know. I think there's something to take away from that because you can never let money kind of. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely what creativity. forces you to be even more creative, obviously, because you have to like actually Thanks. figure out like how to edit it down or where to like allocate the money. Is it towards the model or is it towards the location or um, budgeting? Yeah, yeah. It's just how you spend it, and yeah, it'll it all a lot of times is better when you don't have that because it forces you to think outside the box or be really smart about how you're using it. I mean, I think even at a larger company where you do have resources, it's like to have that scrappier approach is still really great because you can kind of take the budget and stretch it even further and do more. And I think now that there's so much emphasis on more, more, like more content, you know, more like, please make a film, make 10 films, like make an Instagram, you know, everything. I think um, even these large creative budgets are stretched and, um, it's great when you have people who know how to be clever and creative. I, I totally agree with that because I think like even for me when, you know, I sort of transition more to being a photographer when I'm on set, you know, the the demands are so high now. It's really, it's creating, you know, X amount of images, a film, social media, BTS, um, I'm trying to think what else, but I'm sure there's something Look, else. Lookbook. Yeah, exactly. You know, and also like, oh, and there's also this one capsule image that just needs to be this one image, but no big deal, right? It's just one image, but really, it's like the the time. It's like if you know, if it's a 10-hour day, you're, you're really working 10 hours and more, like if if not. And I think being crafty and sort of like all the creatives that are on set, like everybody knows. Okay, so this is what we need to do. This is the this is what we're here to do today. But like you need people sort of on set to sort of be crafty at all times because some things don't work out. You know, you could be in a studio and, I mean, I can think of situations where, you know, you're in a studio and one model got sick, so the other person's coming. It, like, there's just, like, bullets thrown at you all, you know, all day and you're just kind of, like, ca playing catch, trying to figure out how to, like, solve those things. And, of course, you know, sometimes it's a little bit easier and a little bit, you know, smooth, but it's not always like that. So I think being able to, you know, be quite flexible and being open-minded and being crafty gets, gets you a really long way because you need to be able to, to be quite relaxed during those, you know, situations because things happen all the time. I mean, listen, like, I shot a Uniqlo campaign, like, uh, a, 
a year and a bit ago and the whole day was like full storm. I mean like full storm and it's spring summer and it needs to look like everyone's having the most wonderful time and we were all having a lot of fun on set but really it's like the model's freezing, there's someone like you know the photo assistance thing is like flying through the through you know this other thing and then there's a you know there's so many th curveballs and the whole idea is the final product needs to look like it was just like the most perfect, beautiful, sunny day. Or and it did. Ex it, it is, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, transitioning to Uniqlo, uh, Shu, can you tell us a little bit about the campaigns? You included some from Nike, some from Uniqlo. Can you tell us yeah, I put in a little a, bit about what you... A few things, yeah. And I wanted to, um, I think, I, I, Alexandra's point about um, having a story for the brand um, is really key because um, Uniqlo is a huge you know, company, um, millions of units, lots of different products, different collaborations. And so it's important to kind of have this touchstone or this um, philosophy uh, to kind of base everything else off of. And so I think as you um, develop your own brands, knowing you know how you want to talk about yourselves and what are the key words, like copywriting is going to become kind of important because as, as great as the images are and um, as much as they convey, it's important for you to have you know, the background and, okay, what are you, what is this about and who are you and why should anyone care and, you know, really the story about the products. So um, with Uniqlo, that's something that we've been developing. Um, this is a brand that, like, comes from supermarket culture in Japan. So even if you've gone to one of the stores, you can kind of tell, like, the way it's set up, it's, um, it's like a convenience store sometimes and it feels really transactional. And so we've tried to... Um, change that a little bit by adding some story and some philosophy, more collaborations, um, a lot more information about the products. So I think um, this is a picture of a collaboration that we do called Uniqlo U, and it's with a French designer named Christophe Lemaire. And the point here was that this is the first um, 3D knit dress that we had made um, at a mass level. So, you know, as you probably know, it's really difficult to do this type of knit process because the machines are really expensive and it just becomes a very, um, you know, whole garment knitting is, is an expensive proposition like all the way through. So this was um, really to highlight that we had developed this um, production method and photographed it in a way that we felt, you know, really highlighted the color and the specialness of the product. So this is not sort of typical Uniqlo photography, but at the same time, it does speak to a lot of the same values of, you know, good quality at a fair price and, and with style. So that's um, that image. Um, I don't know if I <laughs> talk about other ones. That's another collaboration. Um, this photographer is Jamie Hawksworth. So pretty, you know, he's getting very well known and um, definitely a lot of issues leading up to this photo, <laughs> and even on set, as Alexandra mentioned. Um, what? Yeah. And the, the J.W. Anderson collaboration. It is, yeah. So, you know, for example, like the coat, I, can, I think it's maybe under $100. Um, so the idea was to you know, try to elevate, um, use the photography to, to match. And it's not, you know, it's very well made. So we wanted to make sure that um, you could feel that through the photo. Um, so this was, you know, took weeks and weeks. There was tons of like rounds of casting, collaborating with a photographer, with um, JW, Jonathan Anderson, who had a very strong opinion, um, but still trying to make sure we were having the Uniqlo values um, uh, feel that you could feel that through um, the photography. So that was one thing. And, and a lot of this, kind of to what we were talking about, like we shot video, we shot uh, behind the scenes, Instagram stories. So just the one image um, is speaking to this whole suite of work that then ended up getting pushed, you know, onto the different media channels. Um, so for one photo shoot, you get like a ton of content that you then use to, you know, push the product. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of work behind it. Instagram stories was when I forgot. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one. Yeah. 
yeah, there's always more. Yeah, I mean, even when you're, you think about when you're shooting a film, I mean, that's maybe going a bit of on a tangent, but like when yeah. you're shooting a film and while it may be the most beautiful landscape or the most beautiful location, like the screen is quite narrow. So to get a lot of information within this much space and really the attention span, I think now is, it used to be like six seconds. I think it's slowly going down. So I think everyone's just like, it's, it's probably at like two seconds now. So brands like Uniqlo or brands like Gap or brands like all, you know, all of those people, they're trying to capture really like something within a very quick amount, of, like, because content gets passed around so fast. I mean, honestly, like sometimes it will be like a campaign that you think is like, oh, I'm so excited this is coming out and it, it comes out and then the next day it's like a whole other thing and it's like, oh, okay. I guess, I guess, you know, I'm the only one that was excited about that. Like, But you're right, like those timelines are getting so compressed that you can't actually talk about anything <laughs> unless it's happening right now. Yeah, unless it's happening right here, right now. It doesn't, it's like, it's like, it doesn't even matter. But really it's like capturing this, you know, like a, a coat, like a trench like this. It's like, there's so much work and time that goes into that. But really the idea is to capture the consumer and the buyer's attention within a few seconds, really, because if it's going on the story, if it's going on online, on an ad, whatever it is, it's like everyone's attention span is getting smaller and smaller, but the work is getting bigger and bigger. So it's like, how, how do we manage that at the same time? I'm not sure. I definitely don't have an answer for that one yet. But I think the answer lies somewhere kind of in what Ashley was saying, which is be, being crafty and making sure that you are planning and getting everything you need out of these and trying to stretch in a smart way. Um, you know, like this budget, I can tell you, is very bloated. <laughs> so, you know, I'd love yeah, to... I'm curious if Jamie crushier. shot the, all the beat, or like the actual <laughs> stories and whatnot. He did not shoot the <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, like just having to like cover all that content and what that means. Um, I think with Instagram and digital it's like all becoming less campaigny and more like everything's now a campaign almost or vice versa everything's digital content and i don't think our industry is really like ca caught up with with what that is agency wise or or not it's just really confusing i think everyone's being asked to do a lot but i but to um i mean for younger designers we just we work with a lot of like up and coming brands um we shot a campaign for Low Rod, and um, they, um, that was kind of an interesting one because it's like they only have so much money to spend, but it's like how do you get the most out of that one day? And I think because of the work that we do for the line and for assembled brands, we're very like nimble in that sense, and so we were able to like get kind of a lot out of, you know, I think we, it's the Camilla de Terre thing, it. but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting time. <laughs> Yeah, in photography. And think, <laughs> definitely, and I think brands, you know, they want to connect more with the consumer because really, like, if you look at an image and, you know, whether it's, um, I, don't, I don't want to say too many names, but if you compare, let's say, a Mango or a Zara or a Gap or an H&M, like, how do you differentiate? Like, how do you connect with your buyers? How do you have a point of view? And I think brands are looking, the, that's where it comes in, the vocabulary and all the, the DNA of the brand because that's the kind of all you can do is to push those that ethos and those that philosophy through the the content whether it's editorial social advertising and you know keep that editorial approach I guess through through the I content. Think Nike um, was a very different case because it has such a strong heritage, um, heritage but also like reason to exist and you know they really pushing this idea of self-improvement and betterment through physical activity. And so you always kind of have that as your statement to revert back to, and then everything can kind of come from that. So all of the, the tone of the language, the photography, like everything just becomes about like, oh, how do I get better? And, you know, it's it really helps that brand. Um, and I think even... In the last couple of years, Nike's, you know, been in slightly um, on the offense, let's say. Like, they haven't been the number one sports brand, and it's it's had to, ch they've had to change a little bit. They've become more fashion-y and a little bit more pop cultural, more than a little, I'd say. Um, so they, but they haven't really abandoned, like, that idea of, you know, go out and do this thing or go and be active. Um, so in that sense, it's very, it's always been very clear um, how you approach, how one would approach 
uh, marketing there. Whereas Uniqlo, um, and I, I also wonder with fashion, you know, it's not as strong and clear. Like there, it's like, what do you want me to do? I don't know. <laughs> like, go buy this. So it's a really different. Um, I guess my point is, it's it's so much easier when you have a purpose and you can um, articulate that. Another question. Um, That's Laura. Okay. Uh, what? No, no. Did you want to? Did, did someone? Oh, want no, to? that was just like the low rod campaign, the thing that we shot for low rod. So it's like those, and then we also went outside and shot something outside, and it's just being like they needed like um, a few things to last them through the season. And I think when you're shooting lookbooks too, it's like another way of like how do you use the day? It's like you are like booking a model and like pull, putting the production on for this huge shoot. And like you just kind of, I think now you have to like be really resourceful about how you use that time and not just like, you know, spend all day like taking 25 shots that look exactly the same. Cause it's just, I mean, the way that it even looks on like someone's Instagram grid, it's like not um, diverse enough. And I think, I mean, that's really how we built that like protagonist and Kate brand was like through um, shooting like a ton of editorial and a ton of um, social content so that you can do the click through. I think a lot of stuff is happening in the industry where it's like more brands are going direct to consumer and so it's kind of really changing the landscape of retail. Mm -hmm. Well definitely. I mean you guys are highlighting some of the pressures that are put on creative industry, you know, the fashion industry professionals. We know this from fashion design work, the ever increasing seasons, how you have to quickly get work out there, but also, of course, with Instagram, this channel, that channel, and the next channel that's yet to be imagined. I think um, there's a TV channel now that I have yet to figure out. <laughs> there's a lot of pressure, um, yeah, on individual working bodies and what they are supposed to be able to produce. Um, Shu, I want to go back to something you were just saying about Uniqlo and that it's harder in a way, Nike has this idea of become better, right? Um, but it's a little bit more difficult at Uniqlo. Could you talk about Uniqlo's brand a little bit more? I mean, there is this lifewear idea, but also the collaborations. Right. You know, yeah. Uniqlo has, no. <laughs> it's not just like sure. another high street store. Yeah, it's it definitely has... not another high street store. And I think even referencing the supermarket is one way to kind of give you some context. Um, it, it, Uniqlo, um, you know, everyone's a designer in here, so you know how difficult it is to make product. But Uniqlo actually, what they've done is um, control the supply chain. So all of the different production, you know, in different markets, um, this is something that's overseen by Uniqlo. And so what happens is um, a lot of uh, the products, um, you can get really good quality because you're sort of seeing it through from idea all the way. Um, and you you are able to control the raw materials and the means of production. And so anyway, you, you end up being able to have really great product um, at a fair price. The idea is that it is great basics, so you're not throwing them away and it's not so trend driven. Um, and it's really more about this thing that you kind of go back to like a puffy coat, which most people probably have. Um, you know, and in order to grow the business, of course, um, there has to be desire. And the collaborations help to create desire. And that's really the point is um, not only, you know, are we looking for collaborators who are bringing something to the table that we can't do ourselves. Like in the case of J.W. Anderson, he's really quirky, um, has this super British sensibility. We wanted to make icons, kind of British icons, um, but re reintroduce them with like Uniqlo fabrication and um, more practicality. So like you know, bonded seams and waterproofing and things like that. So the idea was that we kind of got together and created something better. And that's usually the, the impetus for a collaboration. But of course, the other impetus is to create desire and demand and get people interested in coming back to your store, you know, whether that's three or six weeks or whatever it is. So um, the photography has to aid in that demand creation and in that desire. Um, but Essentially, at its very core, the brand is about providing well-made basics at a good price um, that you know you don't get rid of, that you kind of hang on to. Um, and there's a lot of thinking that goes into that. So, and anytime there's like a fast fashion um, parallel that's that's drawn, um, you know, you have to like stamp that. 
out <laughs> very quickly because we really, you know, it's like H and M. Uh, no, Zara can't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no offense to those brands, but I just think being in that category is not, um, you know, hopefully is, is not the perception. At least that's the goal. Yeah. Okay, I have a couple questions, so take this where you will. Um, one, another thing you mentioned is, or just more generally, you, okay, you mentioned Nike, the brand comes before the product, and that's like backwards. But, so what is the relationship between brand and product? How do you guys think about this as you are working to situate products and brands or a brand narrative being driven by the product and telling a story around it? I almost think the narrative isn't totally secondary because it's also how you pull people in, but how do you create relationships between the two? Or maybe that's too broad. So let me get specific, or unless anybody wants to answer that. Well, I think it depends, right? I mean, I think there's two different approaches. One is like people have a story they want to tell and they want to tell it through something, whether that's um, a piece of art or a book or music or designing, you know, clothes. Um, so it's like, how do I express myself through this? Um, that was really the Nike model was we have an idea and we want to express it through these products. I mean, you know, in, a, in the most positive sense. The Uniqlo idea is we have this amazing supply chain. We know, we can see that people want these things. So let's just make them and then we'll start to tell stories about them. So it's a little bit of a reverse and I think both are interesting, but I don't think either could, I don't think either model could exist with just one silo. So you can't like, I don't know, have a product in the market and have no story. And you can't have a story and have bad product. Although a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. I think for the line, I mean, there's so much storytelling that goes on through the like chapters that we, we have on our like editorial stories. Um, and I think in terms of like, I mean, we always are working with like a merchant or um, a buyer to sell a product, but I think there's so many like interesting ways to tell things. Um, I can, one of them, I think that actually maybe... It's coming. It's, it's somewhere. <laughs> such a big file, it takes a while to go. There's a lot of images. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the one with Saskia de Brow, and it's, um, it was for an advertorial that we shot for a brand called Reposi. So um, it was, we pulled on like um, this book um, called How to Speak Italian, a Bruno Minari book. and kind of did the motions. We, I mean, they're like close-ups of jewelry, but like we like did all, we like kind of mimicked the book and like told that story of the jewelry. Uh, the designer's Italian. Um, so it kind of, um, I mean, that's like a different type of storytelling that I would imagine that we told for a brand that was based on like having to sell product, but it wasn't like, um, I mean, to me, it wasn't very like product driven because mm -hmm. it was telling this like beautiful story of that book. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finally. Oh. <laughs> it's this one, yeah. But I don't know how many people are familiar with that book, but it's a really nice um, the Bruno Munari. book. A lot of expression. Yeah. And we've actually tried doing this, this shoot like several times with several different models, and it was really, really difficult to find a model that like was able to express the um, like anger and like the different like, um, I don't know, facial expressions that um, that the book did. Well, it's quite, I mean, to think about the, like the <laughs> art of, cause, so I just want to jump ahead to this question of collaborations because here the model and the positioning is obviously such an important part of the storytelling, you know, the way the body is in performance. Obviously, if you just have a hand like this, that's a totally different story than a hand like this. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how do you find collaborators? What role do other people play on the shoots? What is it like working with others? And then specifically, I'll start with you, Alexandra. Working with models and what role does the photographer and model, how do you be in dialogue with one another to tell a story? Um, well, I think for models, it's, you know, I think as a photographer, it's really important to have a connection a little bit with the model. I think that if you're able to connect with the person because you are essentially collaborating and, you know, if it's, 
if it's a commercial client, then there's a lot of people involved. I mean, it's not just, oh, I like this person, let's, let's book her. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that come into play, like, you know, whether it's diversity, whether it's um, age, whether it's um, size. I mean, there's so many things that come into play. So for, you know, commercial work, it's, it's quite different, I think, because of course there's like, oh, this is how I see it, but really like the marketing or the creative director or the designer sees it something completely different, you know? So of course, sometimes we're all aligned and it's awesome, but it's not always the case. And I think for editorials, um, it's about who's really, who, who do we think is going to, to, to take the story in a place that we, that we want? I mean, where do we want the story to go? Do we want it to, do we want a girl that, you know, is, is, has, moves a lot. Do we want someone who's more quiet, but who's very, you know, strong, has a very strong presence? Or do we want someone who, I don't know, who has a very strong style herself? Or do we want someone who is a bit of a blank canvas that we can do whatever we want with? I mean, when you think about it, it's like even within, you know, this slideshow, Saskia and Otilia, and there's a few girls that come back into play that, you felt like Saskia was like, for example, like perfect for this project. And then, you know, I booked her for something completely different and it's the same model, but viewed by two completely different creatives and point of view. And I think, I don't know, I think that comes into play as, as well. I'm not sure if I'm totally yeah, making so sense, telling. but. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of collaboration, I mean, I think it's just like speaks so much to like who you like can work with and I mean our team at the line is like so tiny it's me a stylist Gabriella who's in the audience <laughs> and um, we do like all the production all like everything is done ourselves in terms of just like making a shoot happen um, we have two graphic designers um, as well but it's a very 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 small team and I think we've learned over the past four years like how like to like basically like read each other's minds and I think that like is so it just says so much about the work because we're able to just do it so quickly because we understand each other and we know like the collaboration is so deep that and I'm sure you experience that with Alona as well like it's just so it pays to work with the same people again and again and as you said like even same for models I think like knowing that okay like let's say we're you know this the shoots are going to be a little bit tricky we're in this really cold weather like okay let's make sure we don't get a, a diva or like okay like we're shooting in I mean those are things that come into conversations because yeah. when you have to create that much content in one day you need to make sure that the model is going to be able to pull that off I mean, I think so. If if you're good, so I think sometimes it, there there's a reason why certain models get booked over and over and over again is because either they have a great look, but also usually they have a really great personality and they make everyone's job easy. And the model is kind of like the last thing we want to stress about. Like there's so much going on, the model just needs to like, you know, be good. <laughs> We've had this new trend too, and I'm sure you've had it, you've seen it of course, where the model, you know, the professional model has now um, been, you know, some, sometimes cast aside for more of an influencer model. So somebody who has like a huge following or is more of a personality. Um, and and I, we've, we've had like, not, we've had challenges at Uniqlo where we have picked people like that, but realize that actually they're not professional models. And so there is so much more direction that has to be given and more time in hair and makeup and like maybe just more photography that has to happen in order to get like a certain look. But I think the benefit is, I think to what we were talking about earlier is you get this one shot to kind of get the point across and this person has, you know, already so much traction in culture that, that becomes more important than, you know, having the perfect model. Yeah, I think like even, you know, whether it's a celeb, we are shooting a celebrity versus a model versus an influencer. I mean, those are three very different ways of working. You know, if, if it's a celebrity, you're, you're essentially, you know, there's so many rules and restrictions before you even get to put out an image of that one person. And then a model, I think, is, um, you know, I think editorially at least is when it's the most fun because you get to really have 
you know, not necessarily full freedom, at least with unconditional we do, but in general it's not, you know, it's a lot of freedom. And then when you work with an influencer, it's something completely different where, you know, you know that that influencer is reach is whether it's an influencer in the UK or whether it's an influencer in Brazil or Asia or wherever that's the market you're trying to hit and maybe like a regular model is not necessarily going to have that kind of reach but then is that person going to execute the concept perfectly mm -hmm. you know that's give or take like if you know if you're lucky great if not then but at least you're still getting sort of like you know what you pay for I guess it, I mean it really is what you get what you pay, you get what you pay for I guess, I think, I think of it that way. And it's, and it's not like one is worse or better, it's just each needs are different. So, you know, there, I mean, you have to think about it, like if there's a puffer jacket from Uniqlo, like how many times can you sort of like reinvent that concept and resell it season after season? You're gonna have to do some things with an influencer and it might not be the, the most creative, beautiful, but it might get way more sales than that one picture with that huge photographer and that huge model. I mean, redistributing budgets is a whole other, that's a whole other conversation, really. But I don't know. So I'm running out of time before we open it up to the crowd, but I just wanted to highlight some of the other projects you guys are involved in. Um, Shu, you sh included some images from Table of Contents, the story you had in Portland. Um, Alex, you also included some images from Unconditional Mac. And then tied into that, I wanted to think about the line a little bit more. And I, I love this tagline for the line, style in context. So basically, I want to use all three of those examples to think about how do you, we've been talking about brand narratives. Well, how do you create narratives around multiple brands? How do you put these brands in the context of a retailer or a magazine? What are some of the um, aesthetics that you were going for with that, those projects? Open to the crowd. The um, I mean, I think, huh? The images will come, it's just... Oh yeah, I think in terms of the line, um, the, yeah, um, hmm. I mean, I love that word context. That's like my Oh yeah, jam. style and context. Yeah, I mean, that came from like the actual, like there was like an offline and online experience and um, just getting to even like have a retail experience is like looks like you're walking into someone's apartment. That's like, was like kind of revolutionary in terms of like just retail in general especially in New York landscape, like in LA. Um, uh, and then in terms of the storytelling in context, I think it's always been like really fun editorially to always tell a story that has a context, just like how I was explaining how the Raposi story had the context of like this art book. And then, um, I mean, there's, there's so many, um, we did like a Leonard Corrin, um, that was maybe one of my favorite stories about like, um, which I didn't include because I think it was it's like all, mostly fashion yeah. stuff, but the like home part of the line obviously is very special because there's so much more context in terms of um, designers and art history. Um, but we did a story just um, featuring like the art of arranging um, based on Leonard Corrin's book, um, The Art of Arranging. And it's just like thinking about those type of, like being able to sell something in an e-commerce platform, but have it have the context of um, art history and, and whatnot. Yeah. And, oh yeah, this was, the, <laughs> they're all kind of playing at once, which was kind of cool, <laughs> Mariana. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are all for different brands. That was for protagonists. The one behind it is from, is for a Vince, Camp. I don't know how they're all playing at once, Mariana. <laughs> That's the line. Oh, so that one is for the line. This one is for a brand called Protagonist. The one behind it is like... It looks kind of amazing screen. like that, yeah. though. I, I'm like, it should be my screen screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Um, that was a totem campaign. Um, and I think also, like, to... One more point that's kind of interesting is, I mean, on top of everything is just the, the research and the references that go into each concept. So, you know, I think like, you know, to kind of like reinvent the wheel a little bit on selling a gold ring, I mean, really like the 
concept that you came up with is like super special because maybe, I don't know, that's when the editorial approach comes in is pulling, being able to pull all these really interesting references and, and I think that's a huge part of it because otherwise everything will sort of just look the same, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it, it does kind of look the same to a certain, like with social media and stuff, it's hard to like not get so inundated with imagery and like people reposting like vintage images and, um, but it is like, I mean, a huge part of my like ref like that's how any shoot or um, project starts is with our reference, like with art references. So there's always a story behind it, I guess. I didn't see um, I didn't see any table of contents photos, but that's okay. It's coming, um, it's coming. Oh no, it's fine. <laughs> I can just speak to it. I had a small shop in Portland when I worked at Nike, and my husband and I basically funded it. We ran it. We did kind of everything for it. We did all the buying. Uh, we did. We ran the social media accounts. Um, you know, we worked at the store. Uh, we arranged the store. We did all of the advertising so um, and then we every season we did collaborations um, as a part of so that's just a picture of table of contents um, we would do different collaborations with artists um, like we completely changed the store at this point uh, because of what the concept was and so as you can see the point was not about making money um, and we didn't <laughs> so <laughs> it was really this um, exploration of you know really what what are our, what are we really interested in and what how do we be how do how do we exercise creativity outside of the office um, and it was Portland so it was fairly affordable to take a risk like that um, but what was interesting I think um, you know what all of us seem to share it's like as an editor Alexandra does that um, Ashley is an art director and I think with table of contents it was a little bit like a curator um, but also a buyer, and so constantly applying, you know, your point of view to this mass of culture and imagery and product and stuff, and then whittling it down to um, what you believe in and kind of what you want to see brought to life in a space that you control. I think much. Um, that's really what a lot what we have in common, um, and so that that was kind of how I I thought about table of contents. This was for a we did like a ping pong. We made this like giant. Um, really uh, not sustainable like marble ping pong table and then we did a ping pong um, tournament with like local businesses and we had these paddles designed and everything so it really was this kind of like a full concept uh, thing and you know I definitely miss miss it it's sort of bringing a tear to my eye but I don't know if New York is the place for independent retail um, so just as an aside. You don't know if, if what is the place for in New York? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Because it'd be great to, you know, do this again, but I, it's the climate is, is pretty tough. Um, rent, rents are high, and yeah. um, it's, it's not a sustainable thing to do here, which is sad. But um, It's interesting. It's an interesting tie back to our conversation last time where we had two uh, designers who own their company, and they spoke to relationships with small retailers and to have people be in support of them. Um, you sp spoke of your point of view in the store. To have the designer's vision intersect with, you know, a buyer's point of view is an important relationship that could make a career or at least sustain a career. It's an interesting We took a lot of risks. Thing. I mean, we definitely looked at young emerging designers, people who didn't have necessarily showrooms or representation. Um, it was always really important to see somebody who really um, had a sense of purpose and like a real craft with the product. Like, are you, do you have integrity with um, how you're talking about what you've made and um, the, the thing itself? So I think there were a lot of, yeah, it was a, it was a really good, dialogue between us as the store owners and the designers and the different collaborators we had um, working together. That's interesting. So Alex, you speak, the magazine is for women, by women, producing an idea of women. Could you talk to us about that point of view? Um, yes. I mean, the magazine is created by women and our art director is a man. He's actually also in the audience. <laughs> but um, the concept and the the point of view and the sort of like the our our world is 
a, sometimes I freeze a little bit, but <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a women's magazine created by women, and I think the, the whole idea behind it was um, to just create a space that really was free from advertising, free from, you know, constraint, free, a, a very free kind of creative process. I mean, we, we were kind of rebelling a little bit against all of the rules that as a photographer and a stylist, we were kind of thrown at for, you know, commercial work and editorial work even because now a lot of it is guided by the advertisers and we're like, well, we have all these ideas and we want to create them and we know, we know the kind of woman we, we want to like create, but at the same time, you know, we want to just do what we want to do. We don't want to, um, um, how do you say, like, just put a girl in, you know, a Gucci dress because Gucci's paying for the advertising. And that's just a random example. But we were just wanting to create nice things that we felt proud of, that we felt excited by, that really came from, you know, our own creative gut, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, we, we've had Lauren Hutton, we've had really amazing women uh, be featured in the magazine. And I think for us, you know, like I said, we're such a small team. I mean, we're, we're only three, four people creating the entire magazine. There's not, it's, I mean, we're such a small team that everything that we create, we're very proud of and very excited. And I think it, that goes back to saying the, the idea of, you know, really believing in what you're doing, working really, really hard and being really crafty because, because at, at least as an independent magazine like this, we, we don't have the kind of budgets that, you know, you would think you might need. But at the same time, that, that editorial approach, f like, fuels our commercial work. So, you know, and like an image like, you know, like this, for example, could be like a beauty campaign end of the day. And then all of a sudden someone's like, oh, we want to we wanna create a beauty campaign based literally off of that one image. So I think it's kind of coming full circle. It kind of comes around. I mean, it's interesting how the editorial work feeds the commercial work. The commercial work pays for the editorial work. So that relationship. Um, I want to have my final question be, in, you know, coming off of that and also going back to the question of the pressures put on creative professionals in the industry. What advice could you give to students who are starting their careers? Who starts? I mean, I have several. <laughs> Um, I think the biggest one is to just work, 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 like work no matter like um, if it's just doing a test for fun, um, so much like comes out of just doing that for no money, for fun, for just like the art of like creating. Um, there's like been so many times where I've like, we've just done something just to do it and maybe we don't even like like the actual outcome of it, but like we learned something in that test period, and so it's just so important to work. Um, and I think the other thing is just to have like the humility of like um, work, like interning is like so important. I um, I highly, highly, highly recommend <laughs> interning um, and just working your way up. Like I like started as a stylist assistant, and I've like worked my ass off for like 15 years, so <laughs> it pays to um, to work because you learn so much from working. Um, so that would be my biggest advice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm, I would say know the business side. Um, really have an eye on the business. What are the hard costs? What is it going to take to kind of make, um, you know, whatever your collection is or, um, you know, know your production, know who you're working with, like um, just understand the business side of things um, because I think whether you become a designer or you go into image making or any of these other things like it's going to be important to understand um, how the money you make gets spent and how to make the money uh, to spend um, and I feel like the really successful designers have either a very strong business partner or are just incredibly business minded themselves so it's not a great creative answer but I do feel strongly about that um, I guess I come from a 
more on the creative side, so I would say follow your gut. <laughs> um, you know, follow your gut. Really, you know, be open to collaborations. I mean, you, you never know. The person that's sitting next to you right now could, could become the biggest designer or your biggest collaborator or your biggest competitor. I mean, you, you don't know, but it's really important to, to be open to all the relationships that you're making along the way because you... you You'd, you'd be surprised. I mean, there's, you know, when I first moved here, I did an internship, and now, like, you know, four years later, I have a magazine, and I, I like, hire these people to that used to be the, the people that I wanted to intern for desperately, and now I work with them on a, you know, on, a, on the magazine. So you really have no idea how much those relationships will pay, you know, will not even pay along the way, but just how important it is to be really open-minded and n not be too judgmental or too, you know, you have to be like a collaborator. It's really important. And I think as, um, you know, as you, as you said, like being, um, you know, working your ass off is, you know, a mild thing. It's, you have to work really, really hard for what you want. It's not, nothing's going to come easy. I mean, even if you have very wealthy parents or whatever it is, like, it, like, People don't really care about that, you know. Of course, you might have like more funding than someone else, but really, the the creative part and the idea and the work process and all of those things really come into play as you're releasing a collection or wh whatever it is that you're you want to do. Whether you're a graphic designer or a designer or, or you know, I, I don't know. I think that's that's really important to just work hard, be humble, be open-minded. I think is really like the most important thing to be successful. Yeah. And follow your gut. I know what you want. <laughs> Thank you. Let's open it up to the crowd. You're done with me. Hi, Shu. From your speaking, I've seen the importance of like integrated marketing communication. So what vehicles does Uniqlo choose to send out their message and message appeal? Uh, great question. So Uniqlo primarily uses the Uniqlo stores as a marketing channel because um, it's free and there's a lot of traffic um, and there's windows which are like billboards. Um, and then I would say, and it's a little bit of an old model because I think, um, you know, it's like that. Billboards and out of home still part of Uniqlo world, marketing world. Um, the other thing is obviously digital, so e-commerce, display advertising, social media. Um, and a little bit more new for Uniqlo is, is really using PR. So how do you like get um, you know, print coverage, but also like more digital coverage? Um, so if you, if you just sort of look at the whole marketing wheel, Uniqlo's a little bit old school, like using these more tactile um, ways to attract. Um, but like at Nike, for example, it was much more digital driven, like mobile um, first and things like that. So I have a question for Ashley. I was just wondering with your imagery, when you're making it, what are you aiming for? Are you aiming to, re to advertise to the customer of the line already? Or is it going towards more social media and, and getting new customers into the line? Mm, that's an interesting question. I think it's never, just because of the way, the like brand identity of the line, it's never to appeal to the new customer because it's, the customer is like very established. And um, so I think it's just always like the editing of, of the imagery and, you know, is it like, I mean, in terms of just like hair and makeup and that type of thing, if that's what you're maybe speaking to, yeah. it's it's always like appealing to the lion's woman, and it's not maybe necessarily trying to reach a new audience, because it's like more of an aspirational customer, so it's like, um, yeah, I think it's more aspirational in the sense that we're always editing back to make sure it fits that kind of aesthetic, if that answers it. Hi, um, so I'm wondering for Uniqlo, how do the relationships become about with the designers that you collaborate with, and how do you guys choose those designers sort of accordingly? Yeah, um, good question. So it's sometimes really organic. Um, it can be anything from, oh, I just read this article, and the, this designer mentioned Uniqlo, and it was in a positive context, and you know, she's really interesting, so 
let's just reach out. You know, it, it can be as, um, you know, sort of off the top of our heads as that. Um, and then as you start to progress in the relationship, if it actually happens, it is much like a relationship, like a romantic relationship where you're like, do we get along? Do we like each other? Um, do we have the same values? Do you, do you as a designer, you know, care that you're, you're going to have half a million units of something in the market versus like, 30. Um, so there's also that that part for the designer to understand like this is a big business and they need to be okay with that. Um, and then working, we work all the way through to the campaign. Um, so there's that way. And then the other way is, um, okay, what do we, where do we need to grow? Um, what markets are important? What cities are important? And then looking at designers from those places and thinking about, um, you know, oh, we want to grow in Berlin, for example. Um, there's really great designers there, but can anybody do something cool with down? You know, can anybody do something cool with um, heat tech? Um, and so that's another way uh, that we find people. And, it's, and then it's still the same romantic relationship, you know, after we've identified somebody. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, so you guys all kind of touched on how fast paced the industry is moving for each of your kind of divisions and sections uh, for fashion design. I was kind of wondering um, if you could kind of elaborate more on how to kind of not necessarily cherish, but appreciate all the work you've put into the photography and the designing and everything that everyone goes into these collaborations while continuing to kind of move at that pace that the industry is pushing a lot of these creative minds to go at, if that makes sense. I mean, putting together the slideshow was like one thing I'm like, oh yeah, we have done like kind of a lot of work. Um, it's sometimes hard to like take a step back and like realize the amount of work that we've produced over the past like five years or something. But um, I don't know, it's kind of just, I guess the way it, you like have to live, it's just like, I mean, a new, and every day is a new day. I mean, I think about, that's how I think about the projects, I guess. Is, um, but it is gratifying to see, like, you've done a campaign and it's, like, out in the world. I saw Low Rod somewhere uh, today and I was like, what a great campaign, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, like, other people appreciate the work and um, you see it celebrated. And I think you have to pause because otherwise you'll just kind of keep going and do the next thing. But um, it's a good, it's a really good point to try to, like, stop and you know, enjoy seeing, you know, it's very hard for something to yeah. make it into the public sphere um, like that. So it's probably a good. Yeah, yeah which is probably magazine wise, <laughs> must be nice to. Oh, I mean, between, you know, the magazine and commercial work, it's like, you know, 24 seven, I essentially have two, two full time jobs. So it, it is definitely important to pause sometimes and appreciate and be, you know, appreciative of all the work that, you know, we create, but also, you know, you, you definitely don't want to drive yourself crazy because as creatives, you still want to find time to be creative. So when the time, when there's so much pressure, like there are moments where, wow, like you just need to like step away for a little bit. It's, I mean, it's, I think especially in New York because it is so intense, like there's always something. So I think sometimes like even just taking a road trip or going upstate or, I mean, honestly, even just like driving, like as simple as driving and just being in a car alone or turning you know, off your phones, turning off they your just, phones. They just yeah. came out with like a new it's thing. It's really about finding those moments where you, where you, you, you just reflect a little bit on what you're doing and, and why you started and why, what, what are your goals and what are your ideas and how are you going to make those things happen? And, and, you know, there are moments where you're, you know, you're maybe like home alone or on a train or whatever it is, and you just kind of write down these ideas and then say, okay, this is this is how I'm going to get through the day, or this is how I'm going to get through the months, or okay, maybe there's like these crazy deadlines coming up in the next three weeks, but you know, first week of December, I'm going to take a couple of days to just like have a second, and really, it's really important to 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 not you know um, feel too much pressure because I think. With social media alone, I think it's really it, the brain kind of never stops, and like it's constantly there's constantly things happening and constantly things being thrown at you. So how do you stay creative, or how do you? It's it's. I mean, everyone's different, but um, I think for me, it's sometimes really just kind of stepping away, even for a few days, and then just like feel rejuvenated a little bit. I mean, even just like spending time with family or with people who have 
nothing to do with what you do and just ha talking about things that have nothing to, they don't even know what casting is or anything like that is like the most refreshing thing you can do, I think. I have a question about collaborations, and I guess for Uniqlo it's kind of easy because you're Uniqlo. You can collaborate with whatever you want, right? But for us, I guess for <laughs> Alex, when you just started the magazine, I suppose you need to, you will want to collaborate, let's say, supermodels or I don't know, someone who's really established in the industry. There's someone you really want to work with. How do you bring to the table? How do you start the conversation of wanting to collab or even? Um, for Ashley, do you have brands that just started, they don't have a lot of resource, a lot of money, but they really want to work with you, they want you to help them. What would, you, what would make you feel like, okay, maybe I would want to try to work with them? Um, I mean, just in terms of, um, I mean, to talk about collaboration on the like other side, like on the, just through photo and stuff, I think that's like a very special thing the collaboration that goes on between like me, the stylist, um, the photographer, the model, like that kind of like collaboration is something that's like obviously really special and um, important. Um, but uh, in ter and then in terms of like collaboration on like working with an artist or something for an editorial, we've done a few um, editorials where we've um, had to tell like a bathing suit story and I it was, the idea was to like create watercolors because they were big bathing suits and so I hired like a, a watercolor um, illustrator that painted him named Rosie McGinnis and um, I think that those type of collaborations and there was another one, it was a home object story um, that I commissioned the artist Ruth Van Beek um, to create like collages with the art objects so we photographed the art objects and like those type of collaborations, I think, just come from, like, I see people's work out in the world and, like, reach out to them based on if it fits with a line or if it fits with the aesthetic of the other brand. Um, we did something for Rosetta Getty that was kind of similar where we worked with a, an artist um, to create collages. Um, but in terms of, like, buying, I don't um, necessarily handle those. Like, I don't, like, purchase the... I don't work with on the buying side of things, but in terms of like the collaboration of working with artists, um, I think it just comes from being like knowing what's in the world and going to um, the art book fair and like just familiarizing yourself with so like all of the contemporary artists that are doing good work. And but I think reaching out is important and I feel like people are generally up for having a conversation and even working with you. And I'm saying that like without you know, not as Uniqlo person, but even yeah. when I had a small shop with no money, I think people were still interested in doing something. Yeah, and, and so much of it comes yeah. from, like, actually, like, people reaching out to me as well. Yeah. Like, I think it's very important. Yes. And even me, just, like, back, I mean, like, I've always reached out, and I think that's a really important, important takeaway. Like, you never know if someone's going to respond or not. Um, and the worst that they could that could happen is like they don't respond. So I highly encourage everyone to yeah. always email and um, even yeah. if it's like DM. Yeah, I know. I <laughs> it's mean, now shameless, it's but like, <laughs> I mean, it's true though. It I mean, it's like even as like a you know, for example, as a magazine, as a magazine, you know, there's like hun hundreds and hundreds of people that we'd love to have in the magazines, but you know, we don't necessarily have access to to those artists or those collaborators. And you sort of like you know, you get a hundred no's and then you get a yes, and then that one yes will help you get another yes maybe down the line because all of a sudden this one person saw that you featured this one person, and you know, for a year you're like oh I can't get you know those those people I really want to work with and you know it's it, that's what I mean by like sort of like the constant like you, you can't really feel defeated because the thing is there's gonna be those people that believe in you or that find you interesting or that that understand something about you that will just take you one step at a time and then little bit by little bit you you start to see the progress and that's when you you pause and you say oh wow look at where i was last year you know last year i i had one collaborator or 10 collaborators whatever the number is and all of a sudden you look back and you're like wow that's so awesome like i've made such a progress and you know you you, you really have to like sort of like tap yourself in the back a little bit and say oh you know i've said i've reached out to all these people and all these people said no but that one person you know said yes and you know 
on the other side of thing, as a as a photographer, for me, you know, I, I if someone reaches out to me and say, oh, I really want to work with you, and and even if they have no money or whatever it is, as long as I believe in what they're doing or I believe in the project or I or I think that there's we can create something special together, then then that's why you you really have to, you know. Put yourself out there. It's it's really important because if you're too shy or if you're not going to say anything, like it, it's going to be a lot harder. Like you, you can't be scared because you would you wouldn't believe like the the most important CEOs or whatever will will see something in you that is like you know um, that will give you a chance. So you you just don't know who who you're going to meet and how like open-minded certain people are. And if they're not, then it's it's their loss. It's not. It's not yours, you know. At least you've reached out and you've you've made your, you know, you've tried. <laughs> I think. Since you guys are all New York based, I was wondering, um, like, what you guys are doing in your work to push New York fashion forward and make it more interesting. And do you feel that sense of responsibility? Hmm. I mean, <laughs> I think just with. To me, it's not about pushing it forward. It's about almost like taking a step back and um, I don't know. I think I think just based on my own personal style, like me personally, like I like editing, I like uniform, I like simplifying and like the, just like having 10 things in my closet rather than like 100 and I mean in terms of, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know what I'm doing to push it forward and so much. Yeah, I, well, you're here. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, being in New York is a very luck, luck, lucky thing. I mean, I'm not from here. I'm originally from France, and I grew up in California, and then I moved here. And I think, you, you, like, New York is such a special place for creative people because no matter who you're looking to collaborate with or no matter, no, on whatever scale or, or, or path, like, there's going to be someone in New York who, who, is completely aligned with what you're trying to do. Like, there's got to be someone. It's just about finding those collaborators. And luckily, with Instagram, we're able to meet people so much easier than like we were, you know, however many years ago. So if there's people that you're like, oh, I really want to work with this one person, or or whatever it is, it's it, that's what that's the whole part of reaching out. And I think as a you know New York-based publication, we we try and you know sort of fuel that energy as well and work with young you know new york based designers who need help because it, it is about the mix as well you know it's it can't all be high fashion or it can't all be one thing like the, the way to grow as a community and as a magazine or as an artist is to to work with different people from you know different different um backgrounds yeah i mean i like that you Ask that question since we're here and we're in New York, and I I think um, with Uniqlo has like corporate scholarships with Tom, it's called Tomodachi, and I think they there are f a few people who've come through this program um, like Landlord and um, some other brands that have you know. So I think there there's like that corporate side of things, but yeah, like on a grassroots level, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, we have facilities even in our lab um, for production and making small run things. You know, it's like, we should open that up. We should probably have workshops, you know, with students and our designers and kind of trade. There's just a lot of like super interesting technical things that are going on at Uniqlo, um, just with, you know, fabrics and means production. So maybe that's a good challenge, you know, that I can take back aside from the scholarship piece. Oh, and also, I think um, making lists, I know that sounds crazy, but making goals lists, to-do lists, I mean, I live by my lists, you know, like if you say, oh, like this is this is one of the goals that I have, and like, how are you going to get there? Okay, well, maybe you're not going to get through all of them at once, but maybe you, you look at one and you say, oh, well, there's that one person in my class who actually did this internship at this one place, and maybe I could talk to them, and like really connecting the dots it's so much about connecting the dots in terms of in in terms of making whatever you what it is you want to do happen because because otherwise like you, you kind of always have to have the next step otherwise you could sit in your apartment once you graduate and just say okay this is really overwhelming I don't even know where to begin like I don't even know where to start my you know my career but really it's like you make your goal list and then you make your things and then you work out one step at a time okay this is how I'm going to do that yeah. yeah, I also think um, 
going out a lot <laughs> is important. I mean, at least when I lived in New York in, yeah, like the early 2000s, I think a lot of that time was just spent like, you know, making connections, not business ones, just sort of getting to know people and then somehow you end up working together in some form or another. So being social, not necessarily outgoing, but just um, going out. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. seeing a lot. Yeah, there's yeah. so much to see here. It's so wonderful. I mean, I remember when I, like this is like a bit of a thing, but when I when I first moved here from California, I mean, I literally knew no one. I, I didn't know one person. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go to New York and, you know, like take pictures and shoot. And it's like, yeah, no, that, that's not going to happen. Like you, you don't know anyone. And like that's not going to be that simple. And I remember within like three weeks of being here, I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna have to like start reaching out to people or friends or seeing what, what happens. And then one of the first person I reached out to is has now become my biggest collaborator and the person I do the magazine with who's our fashion director, Lona. And you know, that wouldn't have happened if, if I didn't reach out. And, the only, and through that one you know, DM or you know, private message, however we call it now, but it, it created like my entire career. Like my entire career has been based off of our like working relationship and me reaching out that one night to be like, hey, like I see that you're a stylist and you know you live in New York. Like, can we get coffee? And you know, and from that it led to everything everything that I've built since then. So you you wouldn't even believe how what can happen through a coffee or a margarita, or, you know, anything. <laughs> More margarita. <but. laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, sometimes I have a hard time um, understanding campaigns or stories um, through images, and especially ones that are very oversimplified. I'm wondering what do you use um, to portray a story, a message in your campaigns that um, to those elements that will tell the story. Um, but I know, I understand that clothing uh, should be the main subject, or how do you convey this message in such a simple way? That's a good question. I mean, I was just flipping through like TMAG this weekend and thinking like how I don't understand any campaign. <laughs> so. I mean, I think it's gotten a little bit way too simplified, in my opinion. But, but then I look at things like Gucci, and I'm like, what? Why? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I think, it yeah, it depends on what the like, what you're selling, and like, it's just also like I think of what the the work that we do for assembled brands and for all these different brands, like Vince, from Rosetta Getty to. Um, I don't know all these other ones, but like, I guess it's just so personal for each brand and like thinking of ways to interpret. I'm like, um, each one, I don't know. It's very well, actually, you know, the, the interesting thing that you mentioned is like so, something that's like overly simplified or maybe it's just a white studio background or a very clean background. Like a lot of times that actually comes down to the assets that are needed because it's not, yes, it's about the message and the branding, of course, like that's really important and budget as well, but also sometimes some brands, like that image has to live in so many different areas, like it has to live on a Sephora little thing and then it has to live on a subway ad and then it has to live on a banner that's like basically like, you're lucky if it's 16.9. I mean, it's like the, the banner is like this. So a lot of times it's really about where the image is going to live. So if the image is, it needs to be living in a lot of different areas, then most likely, unfortunately for art directors and things, the simple solution is to do it on a simple background. And then to get the brand message across is through the models, through the styling, through a, a lot of different things. But I, I think studio work comes now is a bit of a solution to the demand that's being asked and how do you, you know, and it, and it depends again on all the brands, but I think that's, that's a big part of it, I think today, because, you know, you could shoot like, you know, at the beach or in a mountain or in an apartment, whatever it is, but really like if, if you're in an apartment, let's just say, and then you need to make that image live on a banner that's this big, I mean, 
like the apartment's never going to be that big. So. Yeah, but I think there's just, I mean, to that point, there's like actually really creative ways. I think Courage it was that did like yeah. an advertisement that just said jacket. And I think like that's like some kind of a simplified. Yeah, yes, simplified. And we did cover, the, yeah. yeah, and we had to do a story on like ac activewear on the line and we like didn't have the product in time. And so a clever way to do it was work with a graphic designer to like do a story about like where we just used words about like flex, stretch, reach, and like those type of that was able to d communicate the story about outerwear without even like having the clothes. And I think there's like, yeah, it's, it's tricky with those, those weird long banners and <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible ad placements, but, but yeah. yeah there's, Thank you. There's ways to get creative.